Great. Well, thank you for having me uh, here today. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to get you all up to lunch. If I see anyone nodding, I'll just grab one of his pens and throw it at you. <laughs> no, probably not. I'll let you sleep. Um, yeah, today I want to talk about some research I've been involved in, uh, mostly from the High Plains area, a little bit from Southwest Colorado, but it's, it's high and it's flat, so you know it works. Um, and yeah, I guess to going to do kind of a, an overview, I guess I'm not going to, there's too many co-authors here to even try to acknowledge, so I'm just thanking them all in mass right now and, and at the end, but yeah, there's a lot of people collaborating with this, and I'll try to mention them for you. Um, so I'm going to talk about different types of management levers in these systems in terms of tillage, uh, residue management, uh, cropping system intensification or diversification, um, cover crops, and potentially grazing those cover crops, uh, as well as some newer research I have going with looking at cultivar soil interaction, another management lever that we have. So, um, and some of this is going to be in more of a dry land context, and some is more of an irrigated context. So, just to keep it mixed up a little bit. So, what I'm going to start with uh, is looking at tillage and residue impacts uh, in irrigated corn systems. So, this is research that took place at, um, in Akron at the ARIS um, research station there. And um, basically, this is a continuous corn ro rotation. So, I guess it's not really a rotation, it's rotating the fallow. And basically, what was set up at this place is, is to look at the effects of what happens if you remove residues every year, because removing residues through a lot of the Great Plains is, is fairly common for for different aspects of the livestock industry, right? Or for uh, ethanol production, that kind of thing. And then what happens if you till or no till? So this is very early results, two, point, or two and a half years into this experiment. Um, but already after two and a half years, we already started to see um, differences in total soil carbon, right? So this is no till with residue, till with residue, and then uh, no till, no residue, till, no residue, right? So we already started to see a significant difference in carbon um, I have a student looking at it again this summer, six years in, and these numbers have changed. Now the carbon number is quite like this. So I didn't have those results, clean data to put in here yet. Okay, so soil carbon's been changing. We all know that soil carbon is good for soil health, right? It has lots of different important functions. But I was also really curious. I like critters and whatnot. So um, I also wanted to know what kind of impact these management practices were having on soil macro. Now, why might I care about this? So I'm talking about macrophones, I'm talking about earthworms and other arthropods, essentially. Right? So why do I care about these things? Any thoughts? I'm going to make this a little interactive, so I'm not just talking at you for an hour. They're there, they're free, yes. <laughs> Don't pay for them, that's good. Oh, they do. <laughs> they help decompose organic matter and turn it into nutrients that plants can use. Yeah. And they make channels for infiltration. Right, they make they, they engineer the soil and do all sorts of things, right? So there's a lot of reasons I'm interested in these macrophana. And earthworms especially are ecosystem engineers that are doing lots of changes to the soil structure. And what we found is basically only when you had um, residue retained, so food for the worms, and no tillage, so you didn't chop them up, then they tend to live and thrive, right? But if you have residues and, and till, or if you have, you know, don't till but don't provide many food, they don't grow very well, right? So we saw very, we were very surprised to see where, you know, it was almost like a four or five fold increase in earthworms relative to these other treatments when you have both those things present. We saw a very similar trend with aggregate stability. Why do we care about aggregates in soil? And what aggregates are, they're basically like little particles of clay and sand and organic matter that glom together. Biology. They don't glow. Right, so they do, they're, they're a, a site for things to grow, um, and they do hold, they do are related to organic matter accumulation, and they keep your soil from blowing. Bigger organic or aggregates, you know, they, they allow water to infiltrate, they, they don't blow away in the wind, and there's a lot of reasons we want better aggregated soils. Yeah. Why, why do you think the octopod numbers are higher for the soil uh, It's not significant, but our, our thought here is that they're getting the food they need, but they are they're hard bodies and so they're not susceptible to tractors. One hypothesis. Don't really go as far as I'll guess on it. So we're seeing a very similar trend, which makes it look like this aggregate stability could be caused by the earthworms, or they're both being affected by a similar factor. Um, but anyway, it's it's interesting there that just after two and a half years, 
and we're starting to see these showing effects. Now, like I said, we went and resampled these uh, last summer, and this is some um, more recent data shared by Joel Smithoff, who's in charge of these plots. And he's looking at you know, what's the impact of all that aggregation, especially on, on water dynamics and whatnot. So he's measured infiltration um, for the last five years in a row in all these plots. And what he's found is that overall, on average, is a significant, significant effect is that, well, first residues, just keeping the residues there, improve of all infiltration. And this tends to be highest in the ones where we have no tail response. So you see like certain years, it's, it's much higher than um, other years. But on average, this uh, no tail with residue maintains the highest infiltration. And why does that matter? It means that you know, we get an intense rainstorm, we're not going to get as much erosion. Um, and you know, it also means that that water instead of running off gets captured, right? So he also looked at using neutron probe data, um, how much water was there available at planting, you know, when he was planting the corn crop the following season. You know, and so basically we found that when you have residues, and even more so with residues of no-till, you tend to have more water available at planting the next season. And why might that be? Yes, it's it's greater infiltration, but what other things might be going on here? Any thoughts? Mulch. There's mulch, yeah. So there's especially in the no-till plots. So there's much less evapotranspiration that goes on or evaporation that goes on during the growing season. But also there's snow catch. And we didn't measure this every year, but we saw it that uh, there's significant snow catch going on. And you know, so in some years, especially in 2018, you know, I think there was more of a dry winter. Uh, there was a much bigger difference in terms of how much water is available planting. And on average, they found that this plot, these plots use, you know, I think something like two to four inches less water of irrigation per year to actually have to apply. So that, that's something that's important. Okay, so I know we're, this, we're talking mostly about organic systems, and you know, these are not organic systems I'm talking about, but a lot of these systems, or a lot of these principles apply, and that's why I'm talking about them. And obviously no-till is a hard thing to do in organic, not impossible, but it's a hard thing to do. So I wanted to bring another example of, you know, it's not, we don't have to go no-tillage completely to see benefits. We can even go to reduced tillage. So this is from an experiment um, led by Troy Bowder, uh, just north of, of Fort Collins at our, our research station there, it's ARDEC. And this is a conservation tillage experiment after six years, and they really started expecting to see effects. And they looked at several different kinds of conservation tillage versus conventional tillage. So what do you notice about this? First, you know, there's a lot more residue there. For conservation tillage, to be conservation tillage, by definition, it has to have at least 30% residue on the soil surface. Here they're measuring 46% versus just 4% um, in the conventional system. So in, in, um, contrary to what we saw in the last one, these systems actually aren't receiving different amounts of residue. The residues, you know, they're, they're taking some of it off just for ease of management, but they're leaving most of it there and they're either incorporating it or they're leaving it on the surface. And so here's just an idea of how much is on the surface, right? So we see it measured you know, visually as 47%, but then biomass is also significantly more in the strip till versus the conventional till. And then there's sort of an intermediate they call minimum till. I have some details on this later if people are interested in what those means also. So what does that do to leave residues on the surface? Why is that a good thing? Any thoughts? We know that leaving them in the field for one is good, but what about leaving them on the surface? Less evaporation. Yeah, less potential evaporation. You protect your topsoil. You protect your topsoil, right? So, a um, number of things. So, one thing we measured first, because I'm always interested in macrofauna, <laughs> we looked at macrofauna, and you know, we didn't expect a huge difference, but just the fact that you're not tilling them in, you know, you're not tilling as much, and you're leaving spaces of undisturbed soil, we tended to have more. Uh, macrofauna in general, and most of this was earthworms, this is 2015, uh, than in the conventional till system. They did have to go in the strip till system and, and do an extra till to reform the beds, and I think that caused some issues in 2016 here, but um, still we saw in general more in these conservation till systems than the conventional till. But we also talked about, so we're, we're keeping our, our macrofauna alive, but we're also improving our, protecting our top cells. So we look at aggregate stability. And where you had more residues left on the surface, you know, that raindrop impact, uh, you know, coming down during intensive storms, it's not breaking apart your aggregates at the surface. And so you're getting more of them are, are stable and, 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 you know, keeping that, that surface layer from crusting and allowing water to go in and all that sort of thing. 
I just threw this slide up about 20 minutes ago since we were talking about active carbon. Um, I thought it would be appropriate to show active carbon. We also measured that and it wasn't significantly higher because there's a lot of variability, but in general it was higher in these conservation cell systems. Um, and then just to mention, you know, going back to sort of what's the relationship with all these things and why do we care about all of them? Yeah, Mark. When you say active carbon, are you talking about particular radioactive carbon? No, it's POC C, or manganate oxidizable yeah. carbon. Um, we also were just curious, like, how these things related to water dynamics. Actually, the study was set up to look at water quality, and so it so helped to serve an afterthought. But we found some cool results. But anyway, we found that earthworm count was very highly correlated with infiltration rates. We also found that, of course, aggregate stability, which has a similar trend to earthworm, are correlated with infiltration rates. So we can't really say which is causing which, but we know all these things are associated. And we want to maintain infiltration because, like I said, that's reduced erosion, that's water capture, and that's a lot of good things there. Any other questions right now? Please interrupt me as I'm going. I talk fast here sometimes, so. Okay, and then, yeah, visual evidence is always really nice too, not just seeing graphs. So this is a conservation or conventional tillage plot after an intense rainstorm. You see that, you know, water's pooled in those furrows. Um, you know, it's taken a while to go down, whereas in the um, strip tillage, you know, you see no water pool. Um, also, you see this water is quite cloudy. Um, and, you know, they were looking at what was coming off the field um, at the end of these furrows. And they found that in the, I'm not showing this data, but it was set up to look at water quality. And they were finding that in the conventional tillage systems that they had like triple the sediment load, triple the phosphorus, and, you know, lots of things. So more erosion, and things are going to really impact water quality and lead to downstream eutrophication. And then I should just mention, so we also looked at yield and you know, economics over the course of the study. I should mention that you know, conservation tillage isn't always perfect. There was actually a slight significant yield penalty, uh, especially for corn, through different crops over years of rotation. And they saw about uh, you know, half a ton of uh, corn per acre or less, right? Or per hectare or less. Um, but there were a lot of reduced costs. There's reduced fuel, reduced operating costs, you know, repair. And then when you look at overall profit, and for some reason, okay, that's a Mac PC thing. Um, we look at this bottom line, we see that the actual overall profit or net profit at the end is higher for the strip tool system, even though the yields are a little lower, just because the overall costs and, and fuel and labor and all of that plus. Is that the main inflation in the chemical prices? Um, I don't know there was a big difference in chemical prices because you I mean you think of them like herbicides and stuff. Observation maybe went up quite a bit. Um, I don't feel what was causing here. Maybe. Yeah, I don't think there was a huge difference in there because they, they didn't have a ton of weeds with the minimum flow. We still had some you know, light flowage. Okay. But I didn't do the economics, so I claim all you know, ignorance on all that. Okay, so I'm going to switch now to dry land systems. Um, and talk a little bit, this is with my poster, if any of you that saw downstairs, my student's poster, was on what happens when we intensify or diversify dry land cropping systems. Um, and basically, the introduction of no-till in the last, you know, two, three, four decades has led to improved water capture and retention, right? And we know that because we already talked about you know, the mulch layer, it keeps the soil from crusting over, uh, you get more water infiltrating, and you know, less water evaporating, and that's been fairly well studied, or at least we think we know how that, that works, but there's still a few holes there, right? So what do I mean by intensification, I guess I should go there first, is we're talking about rather than a traditional wheat fallow, wheat fallow, wheat fallow, where you have you know, 10 months of wheat followed by 14 months of fallow. Um, now you, you put in a summer crop every now and then, you know, to the point where you do the wheat corn fallow, or even you, know, you never have any, uh, any fallow in the summer. And that's important because the summer is when we get most of our rain and when you expect to have, um, you know, potentially the most damage from uh, erosion and that kind of thing. And so it's important to keep uh, fallow in some, also for efficiency of water use, right? And then we went just as an extreme of perennial native grasslands, equivalent to like the Conservation Zero Program. Uh, what happens if we keep the soil covered all the time? And so First, um, in a study, this is one of with one of uh, Nathan Chapansky's students and I, um, we wanted to see what, what the impact of this intensification was um, across farms throughout uh, northeastern Colorado and southwestern Nebraska. 
And we found that, okay, on average across all these farms, I think there were like 70 something farms, um, soil carbon tends to increase as you go from wheat fallow to a continuously cropped, continually a summer cropped system. And it's significant even at the zero or 10 to 20 centimeter layer. Usually we think, you know, especially in no-till, that most of the effects are in the top layer, but here we're seeing it down to you know, below 10 centimeters, which is kind of exciting. Okay, so we know soil carbon's increasing. That's related to a lot of other uh, soil benefits. And as we suspected, you know, soil aggregate stability is also increasing. You know, it looks very subtle compared to the, the native prairie or the you know, grassland, but it's still a significant increase over the development. And that's important. And that fits with our idea that this is going to improve water capture and reduce erosion and that kind of thing. We also want to understand the biology a little bit. And you know, this has probably been a less studied part of, of these systems. And so um, Steve, who did the study, looked first at, at microbial communities, looking at phospholipid fatty acids, and found that in general, these more intensified systems, they have more organic matter, more food coming into them because there's you know, more cover in the summer, more carbon inputs overall. And they have overall uh, higher phospholipid fatty acids, which suggests more um, higher microbial biomass, and even stronger trend with fungal biomass. And so, and fun fungi are important because they're actually are um, considered to be really important for the aggregation process. So it's all kind of kind of related. Right, so this, this work came out suggesting that, yeah, you know, that these systems, they are improving carbon. We know they're improving um, you know, precipitation use efficiency. They also seem to be approving the biology and the water infiltration, but let's go a little further. We wanted to see, again, because I'm interested in critters, you know, things I can see, we wanted to see what happened with the macrofauna. And it was kind of funny because I talked to a number of dryland farmers um, before this and, you know, asked them about earthworms on their farm. And a lot of them told me, like, I don't think we have any earthworms out here. You know, or maybe there's a few, but there's hardly any. And granted, this is a lower number than I've seen in the most places I've sampled, but it's still pretty significant. We're talking about, uh, 100 or so earthworms per meter square, right? That's, for me, that's a significant amount. And then other arthropods as well. Uh, oh yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. Th these differences aren't significant here. I mean, it's the exact same trend we saw before, but I had a lower number of sampling sites. This is a lot more work than, than measuring carbon. So same trend, so I believe it's happening, but not significantly different. Thing. And then we thought, okay, there's better aggregation, there's more earthworms, you know, how's that really affecting the water, right? We saw almost the exact same trend with infiltration rates. So this is um, time to first runoff. So you, you start raining down on the soil and you wait how long until you observe runoff, right? And these plots were, I mean, this criminal grassland is significantly higher, but even these are showing a trend of higher than, than the wheat fallow systems. So now we feel like we understand a little better some of the mechanisms behind what happens when you intensify or diversify uh, these dry land systems. Yeah, the, the wheat yield takes a hit for sure, but if you look at overall annualized grain yield, the fact that you're getting you know, more grains every year, um, the, the story comes out a little better and you're improving the soil while you do it. Questions on that? I want to just pause once in a while to make sure I'm not losing anyone. <coughs> so the worms were not really that significant across all of the pods, right? Including the grass? Including the grass, yeah. So one thing I think might be going on here is might be timing and sampling a little bit because earthworms can move and they can go deep when it gets dry and I think we might have hit them a week late. Because I did see quite a bit of evidence of earthworm tunnels here. They were definitely structuring the soil. So yeah, it's maybe a little false representation, but. It looks like arthropods might be more sensitive they can deal with the dryness more. And I think we saw a lot of ants. Mm -hmm. You don't think much of ants, but they're actually really important for structuring the soil as well. There's been a lot of work showing that excluding ants, you know, does all these exact same things in systems where there aren't worms. Mm -hmm. I've seen wheat systems like in Australia where there's very few worms and no worms. They've shown that just ants basically fill that role. And, you know, if you exclude them, then your infiltration goes down, your yields go down, mm -hmm. depending on, on the year. Okay, so, I'm still talking about dry land systems now. I'm just going to talk about another potential way to diversify these systems. So, you know, Merle shared with us in another session this morning all of, all of his work on cover crops um, out in the Akron area. Um, and yeah, so cover crops 
in a lot of the US, they're a promising option to protect soils, you know, keeping that soil from being bare. And it's an extra source of organic matter. Um, but they can penalize dry land crop yields, right? So I think this is pretty typical of other data I've seen. This is now uh, from field station down in southwest Colorado. Where I said, yeah, it's not so close to us, but it's, we're sitting at about 6,500 feet here. And uh, it's dry land system. So it's, you know, there's some parallels with, with around here, right? Is that too much of a stretch? No? Um, and what we found is basically in the first year of this experiment, where we looked at three different cover crop mixtures versus a fallow, is that there was about 25% pen, uh, penalty or yield penalty um, by planting the cover crop. And why is there a penalty there? Anyone but Merle want to answer what's going on there? Water, right? These are dry land systems. And it's dry here, right? They get like um, maybe 14, 13, 14 inches a year or something like that. So but not that year. Yeah, this year was okay. 16 inches a week. That was not a dry year. <laughs> yeah, they, they, well, as is most places, field stations often do better than a lot of farms. So um, this was about average for them, maybe slightly higher. Is what, it was what, at least what I heard. Right? And I'll show another one where they got like 20 to 30 and they said that was a bad year. Other farmers just got no yield. Okay, so why is that? Water, right? So this is a graph showing um, moisture down um, at different soil depths, down to 90 centimeters. And basically this is the fallow treatment with lots of water and these are the three cover crop treatments where there's no water, right? So that explains at least part of the yield penalty there. Another thing in this part of the world, you know, they're not expecting a lot. They don't really fertilize their fields very often. That's typical practice. Um, and so nitrogen could also be a driving factor. So this is a soil nitrate at planting. And we just did two of the cover crop systems versus the fallow. And we found that even though you have these cover crops there that are fixing nitrogen, I mean, they, in this case, they tended to get dominated by grass or even some volunteer wheat. Um, that nitrogen is not necessarily going to be available. And it was, what this suggests is those cover crops were still decomposing at the time of wheat planting and had immobilized that nitrogen. You know, they will in theory re-release it later, but at least at the time of planting, you know, um, that nitrogen was immobilized. So one of these things, or both of these things, are affecting yield. However, this results vary from year to year quite a bit. So this is like this is a wheat fallow cycle, right, or a wheat cover crop fallow rate, right? and um, these are the results from last summer where you know, now we're looking we're about 20, 25 bushel wheat. So it's considerably lower, uh, but this time it's actually, there's, there's no yield penalty at all. And what's going on here? Any guesses? Drought. Drought for sure, right? It hit the wheat yield. It was also dry the year before. Cover crops didn't grow very well. So they didn't use very much water. They did grow some though, and they did use some water. So here's looking at water. This is the fallow, this purple one on the far right. Um, but not as much as we saw in that first year. And so they probably still had some benefits instead of holding the soil in place and providing a little bit of carbon, but they didn't use the water and there wasn't a yield penalty here. And in fact, one of these was actually significantly higher than the fallow, if you believe that 0.04 P equal 0.04, which I don't really believe. I'm not gonna invest too much in. But, um, but then we also saw, <clears throat> you know, this is now the second time we've planted these cover crops in these plots. And there's starting to be a trend that sits behind this bar a little bit of, you know, where we're seeing like a little bit soil or get more organic matter in the cover crop plots. And so it seems like the soil might be approving a little bit. And we're seeing a similar trend with aggregation, not significant yet, you know, at the 0.05 level, but it's, it's getting there. So there might be some improvement, which is, yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess the, the story in Southwest Colorado is, is cover crops probably are not going to be worth it, at least as planted. Here, right? Because too much of a yield penalty for a small soil uh, health benefit. But maybe in the longer run, we'll see. Um, what, what were the <laughs> crops? Were they, all, were they all legumes? No, they were mixes of uh, cocktail mixes. Yeah, so I'm, I have to look that up. I meant to put that in there. It's warm, cold season, you know, legumes and grasses, the whole mix. Um, over enough years, would be a good one. Is that you think that over enough years of it? That's what we're hoping it is. So that the data I'm showing was from the first three years of the Western Sarah Grant, and they gave us an extension for three more years. So maybe by year six, right? <laughs> I don't know if we're going to convince them for another three years. 
Um, okay, so now another study I've been involved in, and this one was led by Nate Shapansky, was uh, also looking at cover crops and dry land systems. But in this case, we want to see, like, you know, people talk about well, what happens if you graze them, and maybe they're not technically a cover crop if you graze them. But in this case, we were planting them as cover crop mixtures, not with forage goals necessarily, but we did graze them. Um, and there are a lot of farmers who are already growing cover crops and in their systems and are accepting that yield penalty, convinced that they need to help their soils. So we wanted to basically get at, well, do they, do they lose anything if they graze, right? And so we did an on-farm trial um, across 10 different farms in uh, Eastern Colorado, Southwest Nebraska, Western Kansas. And you see that this is a precipitation gradient here. So it does get a little wetter as you get into Kansas, so keep that in mind. And here's the, the range here, so we're talking, you know, 15, 20, and most of it. And then it gets lighter in Kansas, and that will pull up over there. Um, and then in each farm, we basically set up a replicated trial where we set up four pastures. Um, and then within each of those pastures, you know, we planted the whole thing to cover crop. And with each of those, we set up um, that four fenced off ungrazed area. So cover crop, you know, no grazing, big enough to be able to measure uh, yield to the yield monitor. So they're fairly large strips, you know, tractor based yield monitor. And then within that, <clears throat> they really did not want fallow on this plot. So we had very tiny little fallow plots that we kept sprayed out um, and wanted to just understand what's, you know, be able to compare these three different treatments fallow versus ungrazed cover crop versus grazed cover crop. <clears throat> um, let's see. I guess what I should mention is like the, before I get there, the cover crops were, were fairly good producing in, in both years of the study. So we did this over two years. And, you know, and they were, you know, provided a fair bit of, of uh, forage for these animals. And the, the producers were very concerned about not using too much of it. They never grazed more than half that biomass. And they, they had very strict rules for how much they should graze. Uh, but they, I think they said something like a weight gain of around two pounds a day or something like that. They, they seem to think that was good. I'm not a cattle person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They were all happy with it. <laughs> yeah. So I was really there to measure the soil fertility and soil health parts of things. <laughs> um, and what we found is that, you know, looking at aggregate stability, that was one thing we thought was going to be impacted by the grazing. We didn't really see an effect on aggregate stability, right? And this is the resistance of aggregates to submerging them in water. And in fact, if anything, grazing tended to improve it, although not significantly. And there may there's some rationale that maybe grazing, if you do it lightly, can actually stimulate root growth a bit, and that can help aggregate soils a little better. Uh, we also looked at bulk density um, and found that there was really no impact of grazing on bulk density either. It's maybe the ungrazed plots were maybe slightly less dense, but I mean, relative to the fallow, there wasn't much of an effect. So, I guess you could say that, yeah, grazing the cover crop did significantly increase the bulk density, but we're still in an area, you know, you're not worried about soil compaction until you get about 1.5, and we're still very low. And on none of the farms did it really even get close to 1.5. So it wasn't too concerning, and we're feeling pretty good about, yeah, you could probably graze these cover crops, and at least short-term impacts on, on these parameters, um, there uh, doesn't seem to do anything. We also measured a bunch of things like active carbon and total carbon and potentially available nitrogen and found no differences, right? And you wouldn't really expect them after just one cycle of cover crops. So could you tell us, like, based on how your study was set up, could you kind of tell what the bulk No, we're just comparing what would happen if you leave the land fallow or what happens if you have a cover crop without animals. And so we're just using our controls and time as opposed to, or, you know, with other treatments, controls, as opposed to comparing it versus time. Because it does fluctuate throughout the year. Sure. Right? Yeah, but, but so like usually before you start, you need to have a baseline for your bulk density. Um, and then you want to know if you're going to be I mean, we would probably have with moisture samples, and we could probably get back to that, but I wouldn't believe it as much as what okay. we saw here for these surface soils. Bulk density is kind of hard to measure accurately. That's pretty fluffy. It is pretty fluffy. And these are surface soils. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, we did notice the only place we even started getting kind of close to 1.5, some of the farms where they had the highest stocking rate and they had clayier soils and it was kind of wet when they grazed, we got it almost into the 1.5 range, but still didn't surpass that. Okay, but there's still this water penalty, right? So we looked at, this is the fallow treatment, and whether you graze it or not, they're still using lots of water, right? Because there's even regrowth after you graze. Um, I should clarify here, these are spring planted cover crops. So they're mostly planted in March and terminated by the end of June, early July. We planted the following fall. Okay, so we measured soil moisture at cover crop termination, so in July. But then we wanted to see if, if there was some ability of these systems to recapture some of that water. Some of the idea of cover crops is that you know, if you get an intense rainstorm, you'll get better infiltration and better capture than you would if they weren't there. And there was some evidence that once these cover crops were dead, this, this difference started to disappear a little bit. They might be helping conserve water a little more. And we really only saw significant differences in moisture below two feet. So. That being said, we still saw across all these treatments a significant yield penalty of having that cover crop there versus fallow, right? So again, it's about 20, 25%, as we saw before. <coughs> Sorry, I put this now in metric tons per hectare, but it's about 15 bushels per metric ton per acre. So yeah, multiply this number, yeah, multiply three, it's about 45 bushels there, about a 10 bushel hit with, with the cover crops. And uh, overall, yeah, this is about 700 kilograms per hectare. But if you look, since we were able to do the statistics independently for each farm, these trends were really driven by one out of four farms that, where we actually got yield numbers in 2016 and one out of three in 2017. We started with 10, we only got yield measured on seven for a variety of reasons. So yeah, again, it kind of depends on the situation where you're at and all that. And uh, yeah, and then the take home story here is, even though there's a, we, a yield penalty, we had economists again working on this, and he suggested that there's quite a bit of range depending on costs, depending on if you have water available for those livestock, uh, if you have you know, your fencing costs and that kind of setup. But on average, he suggested a, an increased profit from that grazing, that gain from that grazing of somewhere between 16 and 80 dollars. So, in that sense, it makes sense. Maybe cover crops can work if you use them for something else than just improving the soil. Okay, so as a last part of this talk, I want to just talk about some new research. I don't have a ton of results to share, but my thought is so much work on improving soil health, and I wonder if we actually manage to get there and improve our soil health or in organic systems where we actually get our carbon pipelines up there, do we then need to start thinking about selecting different crop varieties that are able to better take advantage of these conditions and, and organic nutrient sources, whether it be cover crops or manure or whatnot. And so <clears throat> I start with some, or, and the idea is basically that, you know, crops have been bred historically under a regime of high fertilizer inputs, especially nitrogen, and there's not a whole lot of incentive for them to interact with that soil biology and, and to be able to uh, facilitate decomposition and mineralization of nitrogen. And if you know, there were crops that were able to better stimulate the soil community, be it microbes or earthworms or whatnot, that they might actually be able to facilitate the mineralization or uh, release of nitrogen and other nutrients from those organic nutrient sources. <clears throat> so I did a, a greenhouse study first with wheat, just to kind of explore this idea a little bit. And we grew different varieties of wheat uh, in this case, it was spring wheat because we were growing during the hot summer and winter wheat doesn't do so well. But now I'm working with winter wheat. Um, and we looked at wild types and older varieties and modern varieties of winter wheat. And what we saw is when we added manure or not to these different uh, greenhouse microcosms, that the older varieties, this wild type and this older gypsum variety, they responded a lot more by putting a lot root, more roots down. Whereas these modern varieties, didn't really have much plasticity or much response to the organic matter. They just kind of said, no, oh, organic matter, like I won't fertilize it, I my interpretation. But the older varieties seem to respond more to that, right? <clears throat> we also looked at what was happening to microbial populations and we saw that, yeah, sorry, I now flipped the axis because it's a different person that made these graphs. Um, but again, older varieties over here, newer varieties, modern varieties here. And we saw that these older varieties tended to 
better support soil microbial populations and microbial nitrogen than the modern ones in response to in response to manure being added. So again, when manure was added to these ones, it, nothing really happened to the microbial end or the nitrogen in the microbial biomass. Whereas when you added manure to these with these older varieties, all of a sudden you saw the microbial biomass got a lot more nitrogen. And along with that, we saw a very similar trend with two different nitrogen cycling enzymes. So this is what microbes release into the soil to convert that organic nitrogen to inorganic nitrogen. And so we saw that these older varieties actually caused a release of enzymes. We don't know the exact mechanism, but presumably they're releasing some message to the microbes to, hey, make more enzymes um, in the presence of manure versus that. So I think that's kind of a cool finding. And it was enough of a cool finding to convince USDA to give us more money to keep studying this. So now I'm working with winter wheat, ignore the fact that this is corn. I just couldn't find a good clipboard for winter wheat. And we want to look at how different corn varieties are investing below ground. That, that study first with the wheat? With spring sure wheat. The gypsum? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> spring wheat. Now we're moving to winter wheat. Um, and where we're getting a lot more sophisticated. And we're growing these plants. So we grew these plants. Here's a picture of it. In a 13C labeling chamber. So we're giving them carbon dioxide labeled with a stable isotope to see where that carbon goes down into the plant and into the soil, where it ends up. And then in the soil, we put, so, so we basically think that we can trace the carbon into the soil through roots or through their exudates and whatnot. And then we're looking at microbial communities in the soil and seeing how those change and whatnot and looking at enzymes again. And then we also in the soil put a nitrogen labeled cover crop. So with 15 M labeled nitrogen. So then we can then trace the nitrogen from the cover crop and see which wheat plants get more of that nitrogen, right? So does the fact that they're stimulating microbial communities actually result in more nitrogen for them. And so yeah, we're, we're able to measure that. And so basically this experiment was conducted um, last year and I'm just starting to get data from it. It takes a while to get all this stuff processed and analyzed. And so very, very preliminary results are that there's a lot of variability in, in these species that we have, or these varieties, sorry. Uh, this is a, a wild type wheat, not a whole, not showing here, but yeah, these are all different common wheat varieties grown in Colorado that are recognized. Um, and there's quite a bit of variability in the 13C that we're able to pick up in the rhizosphere. So this is how much carbon they are pulling from the atmosphere and re-releasing back into the roots. So that's good. We want to see variability there. And then our first preliminary result is that we did see a positive correlation with that 13C, or that carbon measured in the rhizosphere, and um, nitrogen cycling enzyme activity. So exactly what we saw before. So now we actually there's some suggestion that wheat roots by exuding different amounts of carbon in the soil can actually influence um, microbial activity. And we still have a ton of other results coming out of this, and but that's all I'm showing you today. I'll show you next year. So in conclusion, does kind of general messages that yeah, reduced soil disturbance and increased organic matter inputs via residues or manure or whatever, generally improve soil biology in a range of key soil functions. Some soil health promoting practices may reduce yields, that may just be initially, uh, but not necessarily profits. And that depends on how you go about managing that, right? Whether you, you know, we saw in conservation tillage, you know, it's actually decreasing our costs, so the profit went up. Or with cover crops, if we graze them, they can actually increase the profits. Um, and that with these improved soil health, we're, we're able to achieve this on a wide scale or with organic agriculture, we may need to start thinking about new crop varieties that are better able to take advantage of um, and facilitate sort of activity with this microbial community or biological community in soils. So with that, I just want to thank all the collaborating researchers, um, Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska, and all the farmers that worked on this, um, as well as different funding agencies. So. Thank you. Yeah. OK. No questions. Just want to, okay, good. <laughs> good. Escape that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Back on that map where you showed um, the farms that you worked with. Yeah. Where was the one in northern Colorado? It looks close to Sterling. Yeah, I think it was. I, I don't remember, to be honest. Okay. I didn't visit them all. It's part of a large project, right? Okay. So, so we're from that area. And we got okay. to join the project. Okay. So we did it. So we will. 
Like, I could like, maybe afterwards I could dig up a list of names for you. You can see if you recognize any of them. Uh -huh. Right. On your spring week that you were looking at with the um, change in recycling, you said there. Yeah. Are any of those things older wheat, like the spelt or older wheat varieties, do they just have a recycling of modern wheat? So, this AT, go back, I wrote the name on the first slide, is a wild type ancestor of wheat. Yeah, so it has a lot more roots, it has very few, you know, small grains, so it's a wild type ancestor of wheat. Gypsum is a, uh, I think it came over, you know, from Eastern Europe. Yeah, it's like 100, 100 years ago plus, something like that. And then initially, this was also an older variety, but it showed none of those things. So. That's so interesting. So do you have a slide of the yield of all these fields? No, I didn't put it on there. I was just, just looking at roots here. Yeah. It looks like almost in your conclusions, you mentioned looking at new varieties, but from what I gather, you really want to go back to the older traits, right? Well, not necessarily all their traits. So in like in uh, what is it? these ones, mm -hmm. this is a whole mix along mm -hmm. from, from uh, wild type varieties to modern stuff. Mm -hmm. And we're really not so, we're not really thinking that it maybe has so much to do with breeding, but just that variation in root traits exist. Mm -hmm. And they probably have some effect on microbial communities and breeders aren't really thinking about this. And so should we be thinking about it is, is really the, the question here. Mm -hmm. Which could be related to the root biomass. So yeah. The size of the yeah, root biomass looks almost identical. Yeah, That's interesting. Yeah, and there's a ton more data here, and I, you know, told my student like, quick, pull me together some graphs. Right. <laughs> so it's interesting that snow mass caused a lot of carbon. So there's a big air body. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, not really, it's a white meat. So. Birds are good for me. So we actually took three of these, and I think snow mass is one of them, I think bird was another, and I can't remember the third one, and planted them out in Akron with a 15 that will cover crop in the ground under your organic plots versus the no non-organic, you know, versus receiving no manure essentially, to repeat like this at a larger scale in the field to see if any of this matters in the field, because it doesn't matter in the field, then who cares, right? Mm -hmm. And what was the cover crop mixture that we used with the 15 that we used? Oh, the cover crop? In this case, it was just a uh, 15 annual vetch. Yeah. So it wasn't even a mixture. So, so you injected with M15 that could be accounted for the nitrogen dispersion crop? Yeah, so we basically grow it in the greenhouse and sand. Mm -hmm. And the idea is you give it so much nitrogen that it won't mm -hmm. fix very much. But our label was still, you know, we added like, and it's 10 out of percent nitrogen, and I think what came out in the end was like nine, so it didn't fix very much. Any other thoughts, questions? Yeah. The comment that reminded me of a little study I did at the Gretchen School for a while. I was interested in organic moisture uptake, mm -hmm. amino acid uptake. I had the same hypothesis that maybe older varieties took up more. And what, what I found was it was related to root biomass. Right. But regardless of, and some, we have red spots, and that actually didn't have very good root biomass. Um, right. So okay. Some modern varieties did, some older. Yeah, we, we kind of started out with a hypothesis of maybe it has to do with breeding history, but we early on writing the proposal dropped that and said, like, maybe that would be one mechanism of why you would have different amounts, but variability is just likely to exist in general. Mm -hmm. So were your termination dates the same for variation of modules? For the cover crop, yes. Okay. Any more questions for Steve? I also had a chance to ask more questions. One more here? No. Do you think there's any benefit <coughs> to the grazing with the animals dropping the manure in the time that the bacteria can make up? Yeah, I mean, I think as opposed to Harvesting for, um, you know, cutting it and taking it away for forage or whatever—it's probably a lot better because you're returning some of it at least. 
yeah, obviously some of it that's carried away in the animal, but yeah, they're returning some of it. It's being processed. Maybe it's stimulating some microbial growth. So I think there's potential benefit there. Yeah, so it's a lot better than than cutting. No, that's pretty good. It's a lot better than than cutting it and carting it off, right? So and it doesn't appear to affect these, these more sensitive, you know, short term like salt action structure that we really stuff. Sorry, go ahead. Did you just plow down your other cover crop or is it hay and all that? So both of those were terminated and that study was terminated just when all the studies were terminated with herbicide and left in place. So no else sir. Because we wanted to maintain some cover, right? That's the whole purpose is they wanted to like the rest of that summer maintain some cover, get some maybe mulching benefit from it. Yeah, and I should highlight that that's, you know, one year study. I don't want to claim that like grazing doesn't do anything or cover crops are great, right? But it's just some of the concerns were early on would, would the grazing affect the stru soil structure and kind of thing. It seems pretty positive. We should do a study on the organic, terminating the cover crop organically. So down in Southwest Colorado, that's part of the project is we are looking at alternative termination methods. And the trick there is it's dry land, right? And it's dry earth in general. And you, if for in order for things like a crimper mulch uh, to work, like you need to have enough biomass for it to actually, you know, lay down flat and smother everything out, you know, and break in the first place. So um, we're gonna try it. Do you have any other suggestions? It's actually yeah, the study we have set up. We have the cover crop growing right now, and. We're gonna kill it in a few months and <laughs> try some different ways to see if we can make it work. But um, yeah, and like back east where they use a uh, roller crimping, mm -hmm. right? That works better. Right. Yeah, potentially. Right, that might work in Southwest Colorado where there are not no-till plots. Actually, we do have a no-till treatment there as well. But. Mm -hmm. Is there a question over here? What would happen if you took the sort of sedan and cut it six times? You cut it about six inches tall, and it would go just either way. How much do you think that would change? I guess it depends. I mean, you're thinking it'll just kill everything by shading it, sort of, or mulching it? To a certain extent, but the sort of sedan that you leave will go back. Oh. You can cut it three, sometimes. Well, they, they want to plant wheat like, like several months after this, so. That'd be kind of interesting because all of that biomass is laying on top. It's going to shade the ground. So right. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of room to play around with different things. I know with especially in these larger plots and on farm studies, like in order for the farmers to still get crop insurance, they had to have it terminated by a certain date, right? And so they didn't want to mess with that. But if you got a small bit of land to mess with it, it would be worth playing with. Time you cut that sort of sedan stresses a plant that drives the wood people. You're doing more biomass. Yeah. Also there. So if you don't take it off and graze it. You can leave it right on top. The front goes down. So I wonder how fast you could change the soil that way. Yeah. It's not cost a lot. Right? Yeah. You lose production for that year, but you should be able to plant. We can and I talked to several of you earlier in the poster. I think there's a lot of uh, potential for longer growing, maybe intercropping or, or rotating with perennial pasture and that kind of thing. Because it is all about the root growth. You know, there's a lot of Evidence suggesting that root carbon is a lot more stable and sticks around a lot longer than above ground. So there's reason to invest in that and understand that better. 